We want to welcome everyone uh, to the Wiser Summit. I'm Susan Davis, and I'll be moderating today's session. Uh, we have with us a wonderful group of Ashoka fellows, um, fabulous women entrepreneurs who are achieving significant impact. As someone who uh, worked with Grameen Bank and BRAC in the past, we always thought of impact as the multiplication of impact through the number of people reached. We now understand in Ashoka that's scaling out and that is one way to achieve impact. But what the Wiser Summit, the Women's Initiative for Social Entrepreneurship uh, is doing is bringing you another understanding of how women's entre uh, social entrepreneurs are scaling impact, achieving um, deeper impacts uh, through changing mindsets uh, in hearts and the frameworks and scaling uh, uh, up to be able to change the, the system, the policies, the laws and regulations. So what we've done today is brought you a wonderful group um, of people who will tell their stories so that we can celebrate the different ways that women social entrepreneurs are achieving impact from around the world. And we'll begin our session um, with Angelou Izelo, um, a social entrepreneur leading uh, Greening Youth Foundation from the United States. And Angelou, can you tell us um, what strategies have you been using uh, to achieve social impact and to scale that impact? Absolutely, but I would just love to start by saying hello to everyone on this panel and thank you for hosting. It's just a pleasure to be here with so many rock stars doing amazing things. So one, thank you for that. But two, you know, when I started Green Youth Foundation close to 15 years ago, in order to change this eternal stereotype that people of color were not interested in the environment, I realized that I had to, as we now define it as scale deep, I had to change mindsets of people who didn't look like the majority, which is primarily white and male, you know, change the mindset of who is allowed to even work and recreate in the outdoors. So the way that um, Green Youth Foundation, the way that I scale deep now is to really do this mind, mindset change. And the most effective way was using social media. Because what I notice, even as myself as a, a little girl, there just were no images of, of people that looked like me in the outdoors, whether it was marketing or just in images of people in the outdoors. So like the famous uh, female astronaut Sally Ride says, you have to see it to be it. So, you know, we believe that by putting images of people of color, of youth of color, doing things in the outdoors, beautiful images, all throughout social media, then it started to change how people saw who can be in those spaces. But in addition to that, we play in the outdoors. So we started show. So literally storytelling, you know, just as we're kind of doing here today, showing the stories of how the young people were succeeding. They were of all ethnicities and all shapes, all sizes. So that kind of opened up the door as to who is doing the outdoors. And now it's starting to replicate itself. And now we're seeing through partnership because I think necessity. Various institutions and colleges and universities, and that's the HBCUs, which is historically a uh, black colleges and universities. I'm serving in Susan's award. And then we, I'm sorry, go ahead, Susan. Am I talking too long? No, no, uh, the sound was a problem. And now, as soon as I unmuted, it came, 
it's fine. So I'm not sure what the magical connection well, was, but here in we can Nigeria, hear you now. Go ahead. There's a horrible storm going on here in Nigeria, so I be able to move forward without much interruption. But I will, I will kind of end it there. Just with those no words. recap, uh, Angelou. Just recap the last uh, couple of points that you made, the last minute or so. Sure. Um, and I found that we've been able to scale out because I, as I said, large scale change requires large, large scale collaboration. So we've been partnering with many institutions and colleges um, that are serving people of color to introduce them to the outdoors. And that has really been work. The impact of that has been incredible. And just lastly, one last thing is regarding scaling up. So because of collaboration and being a part of think tanks and you know committees and so forth, we've been able to really effectuate change at an administrative level with our um, government in the United States. So we've been a part of policy um, making to, to ensure that everyone has access to the outdoors. So I'm happy to say that we are really changing the face of this conservation movement by showing examples, by partnering, and by um, creating policy. Well, so you're actually using all three uh, strategies to scale, uh, both scale deep, scale up, and scale out. Yes. Uh, and Angelou, you're working um, not just in the United States, but you're working in Africa, it seems. You're, you're broadcasting now from Nigeria? Yes, yes. So we do work all throughout the United States and its territories, but we're also in uh, West Africa as well. In fact, I'm, I'm working now from our regional office here in uh, Lagos, Nigeria. Oh, that's great. Um, Thank you so much. And uh, Amina Sonapul, you're, I think, uh, in the Philippines right now uh, with uh, the leader of and founder of Roots of Health. I was wondering if you could tell us some stories uh, about how the strategies you're using to approach scale as well. Welcome, Amina. Sure. Thank you so much. It's it's a pleasure to be part of this panel. Um, I think that uh, my organization is um, 11 years old now, has a lot of similarities with what Angelou was describing. But we basically, um, I started Roots of Health and we work on trying to improve reproductive health, which is a very taboo topic in the Philippines and uh, has been um, you know, quite challenging to make real change and impact. And we started out basically um, with scaling deep. And later this allowed us to basically scale out and scale up. And we basically, in our first few years, it was really very much scaling deep. Um, we wanted to bring about a shift in cultural values and norms regarding sexual and reproductive health. And this really entailed the long-term work of changing hearts and changing minds. And um, you know, we taught in schools and in communities to groups of 30 young people or women at a time. And you know, we provided comprehensive information about their bodies and their health because we're really trying to address the issue of unplanned pregnancy. Um, primarily now, especially with young people, with teens, but also with older women who were having more children than they wanted. So we also started working with our government stakeholder partners on a small scale, just on an individual basis, basically trying to find the, you know, the one person in the Department of Education or the one person in the mayor's office who was kind of on board with what we were trying to do. Um, and we had to devote quite a significant amount of time trying to uh, advocate for comprehensive sexuality education with the Department of Education, because many of the people there basically thought that teaching young people about sex ed was the same thing as encouraging them to go out and have sex. So of course, none of them wanted us to be doing this. So we had to be very patient and we provided data and studies to basically back up um, the fact that there's a problem, you know, that, that to try to get them to not be able to just ignore the problem or to tell us that, you know, Filipino girls aren't like that, you know, we're conservative. Well, the data showed otherwise. 
So um, we also provided teachers with trainings and with overviews and demonstrations of our modules and communication strategies for how they could effectively reach young people in an engaging way that young people would find fun and entertaining. And over time, as these, these stakeholders began to understand our work more, they were able to kind of see with more clarity what we were trying to do. And slowly but surely, we did start winning over some advocates. So in the first five years or so, you know, it was meaningful work, but pretty small scale. And, you know, we taught a few thousand young people a year and met the contraceptive needs of maybe about 700 women. And we had partners, but we weren't regular stakeholders of the government. But from our sixth year onwards, we found ourselves with opportunities to begin scaling our work upward and outward. And um, we had the opportunity to teach more young people in more schools around our province and to provide more clinical services to more women and girls who needed them. So we also spent more time and resources in a third avenue of work before we just focused on comprehensive sex ed and the provision of services. But then we started working on systems change and system strengthening. And with this, it allowed us to work closely with the government partners, basically all the people who are stakeholders for adolescent sexual and reproductive health. And we were able to really engage them in a very meaningful way um, and a sustainable way. And this has been a very important opportunity for us to continue scaling deep um, with these key decision makers. And so, you know, now we provide the contraceptive needs of about 15,000 women and girls per year. And pre-COVID, you know, we were, we were teaching about 20,000 young people the basics of sex ed every year and conducting trainings for our government counterparts. So it was really important to do that scaling deep first so that we could establish ourselves as trusted partners in our community. And it's allowed us to now scale out and up as well. Interesting, Amina, thank you so much. So you're also following the pattern of working on all three uh, vectors of scale. Um, going from 700 to some 20,000 is uh, certainly an example of scaling out in a traditional mm -hmm. But it's interesting that you say you had to um, focus on on finding the one right person inside the ministry um, to, to be able to change the norms, the expectations, and even get the permission to start working before you could really achieve impact. Um, interesting exactly. example from the Philippines. Um, I'd like to bring in now from uh, Europe uh, in Belgium, Miriam Briesen, uh, who's a very interesting uh, example of, of scaling impact. Uh, Miriam, welcome. Uh, would love for you to share your insights. Thank you, Susan. Um, first of all, I love the idea of being a rock band instead of a panel, Angelou. Um, <laughs> but uh, when it comes to scaling, um, we have been going through a journey to come to this point today where I think we are radically choosing to what is called scaling deep. Uh, and one of the reasons why we are scaling deep is, I think, quite common to all social entrepreneurs. We are all tackling a societal issue that is complex by definition. Our society has become complex by definition, let alone our societal challenges and promise, problems. And by complex, I mean systemic, unpredictable, interconnected, rapidly evolving, diverse, impacted by irrational human dynamics, and therefore not solvable by one simple solution, or even not by a model with a set of solutions. Hmm. And with Touche, we choose to work in a possibly even more complex field um, as we are tackling violence, which, which is an eminently rich and complex issue. And all over the world, uh, thousands of programs exist that try to do something about violence out of a single system approach. Some support what we call victims of violence. Others try to prevent violence users from doing that again. Still others try to change laws or leg legislation or try to get more violence cases in court and so on. 
And all these programs, amongst which there are many quite successful, did not manage, however, to make our violent world more peaceful. And in my opinion, the reason why they are not successful in doing that is because they don't take the complexity into account and because they take away agency from the people involved. So by simplifying violence to a justice matter or a mental health issue and outsourcing it to professional experts, we will never be able to address it adequately. We need multi-systemic, dynamic, flexible, interconnected, diverse answers at large scale that restore agency of the people involved. So that means every one of us should be enabled to deal with his or her anger in a way that it will get him or her closer to the person he or she wants to be and can be proud of. So in my opinion, scaling out would mean that we would make the same mistake thinking we can tackle a complex matter with a simple linear logic. But we need to grasp, understand, utilize and impact the way every single person on this planet relates to anger, aggression and violence as a fundamental and even existential part of our human existence and coexistence. And this will impact the systems that we are all part of in our daily lives as we are all parents, partners, children, employers, friends, and citizens. So that mm. is how I think about scale. Uh, Maria, it's so interesting. Now, you're a, a trained psychotherapist, right? Um, so are you uh, working one-on-one -on -one with people in, individually, or how are you trying to tackle this issue of, of changing our relationship with our own anger? And how did you even start with yourself? Well, we are combining lots of things. We are working one on one. We are um, working with individual people, but mo but we also um, work with small groups of people. So families, uh, friends groups and so on, but also bigger groups. And we set up uh, large public campaigns. Um, so we, we combine different strategies to um, make that happen. And uh, with a campaign, G give us an example, because I think we can imagine uh, from the therapeutic model what one-on-one -on -one, uh, maybe discussion would look like, and maybe uh, the group therapy is similar to what you're doing with a, a family system, perhaps. But how do you tackle anger uh, in a pos and reframe it in a positive way through a public campaign? Well, I can I can maybe um, give two examples of that. One of one of them is uh, last year when the uh, COVID situation just started up, we launched an, um, um, a Facebook group um, where we um, asked people to share their own solutions of dealing with the all the frustrations. Uh, that came along with um, the, the COVID situation because there was a lot of anger um, and still there still is a lot of anger. And by inviting people to share their um, solutions or what is helping them to deal with it, we are, in, we are creating a space where they are sharing, not only sharing, but also helping each other. Um, to do something positive with, um, and um, actually there, there were, um, um, we see emerging a lot of beautiful answer stories, solutions there, but also people are connecting with each other there. So that's very interesting. Yeah. And yeah. the second one is we are setting up a societal platform. Um, so we are preparing that uh, at this moment, a societal plat platform where people will be enabled to, um, connect and build up a community. Very interesting. Angelou, we might have to import this idea to deal with anger in America, huh? <laughs> um, but let's uh, move from now uh, where uh, Touche is working in Belgium to Romania. Um, Iona Bauer is with us and the founder and president of eLibraria. Um, you know, what strategies are you using to tackle scale? Welcome. Hey everyone, greetings from Noisy Bucharest. Um, so uh, before starting, uh, I will have to, to give you a disclaimer because I am the, uh, the president of Eliberare, but recently I've also stepped up um, to be a consultant for the, the Prime Minister of Romania in issues that have to deal with human trafficking. 
So I will have to say the magical words that I am not speaking on behalf of the Romanian government, but I'm speaking um, as a person who has worked hard on scaling up, out and deep. Um, and um, I am not the founder of Eliberar. I took it over in 2016. Uh, but since then, we've uh, we've managed to do some uh, some awesome things. Eliberare um, is an organization that has to do with human trafficking, uh, which is not a sexy subject. People don't line up to hear about human trafficking. They don't sign up for um, you know workshops and other things. And especially the people who are, are vulnerable to um, this issue. Um, they actually uh, do not recognize that they are and they do not want to to hear anything about this. And we um, learned that the hard way because um, whenever we started, we thought that, you know, we're going to create resources and people are just going to line up to use those resources because Romania is one of the main source countries for victims of human trafficking in Romania. So when that didn't happen, we started asking questions. And one thing that we realized is that um, you need to make it easy for people to do good and for people to um, actually understand uh, what their position is, whether it's a position of maybe vulnerability or a position of potential of tackling issues um, as important and as um, you know uh, difficult as human trafficking. Um, with that, we had to drop a lot of preconceived ideas. Uh, so when you deal with something that has a lot of bad statistics, in a way, there's this fake dichotomy that there's, you know, the good actors, the CSOs uh, who are trying to uh, to have impact and do all these things, and then um, there's the state who doesn't necessarily want want to address these issues. And in a way, we were going into a field where. You know, this was very much a part of um, of the issue or of the people who were working on the domain. So dropping the preconceived idea meant that we were recognizing allies in people who before were um, categorized as part of the problem. So once we identified the need, whether it was trainings or, um, you know, resources to um, to capacitate state actors or whether it was resources for the educational system, uh, we started designing resources that would actually meet the needs that we were identifying in all these fields. Then we would work on creating a demand for that resource. As I said, people don't line up to just uh, hear what we had to say. Um, but what we started doing was we were finding certain um, loops through which we could talk about the issue. So whether it was connect uh, connect subjects, um, whether it's you know violence in general, the fact that human trafficking is also gender based violence, uh, whether it was safety of communities. Um, we would, in a way, come um, and talk about human trafficking in connection to to these um, to these issues. Um, also, we would find certain procedures um, or certain um, things that are usually hidden in a very boring document that said that people had to address certain topics. For example, in Romania, we have form teachers. And these people have to address things that have to do with civic education or continuous learning. Um, so we created a resource um, that was fit for the educational system. And we started promoting it. Um, and schools started taking up this, uh, this resource because at the end, we, we would give them a diploma for holding this activity. And in a way, we cracked the... Um, the system for the educational, um, the educational area, the educational domain. So with that, we were able to reach 750,000 students in both Romania and the Republic of Moldova. And this meant that um, professors and teachers would voluntarily sign up to do these lessons. Um, and with that, we had partnerships with almost 5,000 uh, 5, schools, um, if not more. Um, then the whole idea was identifying the champions. So if you have people who keep coming back and who want to find out more and who are actually promoting the, the subject and they have their, their hearts captured by the subject, obviously um, you want to make sure that you keep those people close by. Um, 
and they be, you become a come alongsider to them. Actually, that's the model that we talk about, the come alongsider model. So um, this means further investing in these people. And I think this is part of the, um, the scaling deep, right? When you have a professor who held the lesson, but then that professor has suspicions that one of their students might be a victim of human trafficking, you're going to go and capacitate that professor to recognize the signs, to know who to contact, uh, where should they go, and in a way empower them to actually continue to stay engaged with, um, with the subject. Um, in a way, the, um, this method um, also exposes the things that need to be changed, right? And the best way to do that is by system systematizing the, the solution. Um, so that's where the scaling up um, comes into place. And I think here the observation that I want to make is that a lot of times when we think about scaling up, we think about legislative change or um, creating new legislation. But what we found here, um, and it might work in, in other uh, parts of the world as well, is the fact that sometimes you need to find the procedures. You need to figure, figure out what needs to be tweaked or harmonized because a lot of times people have the gates or the, the possibilities to intervene but they're not aware of them or they haven't been empowered to do so. Also, it's about finding the non-traditional or the, the more subtle allies that one can have. So in our case, we started doing um, capacity building sessions with priests, which do not normally hold um, an official role in addressing human trafficking, but these were people who were close to their communities, um, in Romania, we have more Orthodox churches than we have schools. Hence, uh, we were able to find these allies at the community level who ended up identifying and notifying more cases than any other category. So in a way, it's good to allow yourself to be surprised by who your, uh, your partners could be. Oh, interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that. And what an interesting um, set of strategies that you've used to make a huge impact uh, in Romania and Moldova. And congratulations on uh, being almost head of state, <laughs> being proximate to head of state. Um, that's pretty significant impact, I'd say, as well. Uh, welcome back, uh, Nada. Um, I'd like to come to you in case you're having technical difficulties since I see you, and then we'll come to you, Kara, um, to get everybody's voice in the first round of storytelling. Uh, we'll go now to Bahrain. Uh, Dr. Nada Dayef is uh, the chairperson of Bravo, the uh, Bahrain uh, Rehabilitation uh, Center. And Nada, why don't you share your stories of how you're achieving uh, significant impact? Thank you, Susan. Um, first of all, I'm I'm glad to be here with the, all of these uh, dis distinguished speakers. Um, uh, my experience with Bravo, Bravo actually is the uh, is Center for Rehabilitation of the Victims of Torture. And that is uh, the first and only, not just in Bahrain, which is in the whole Gulf states. When I started uh, Bravo 10 years ago, um, uh, first, I'll give you an idea about the global standard for the mental and psychological health, which supposedly to be uh, 30 doctors or specialists per 100,000. <laughs> but the case in Bahrain, we have only three serving 100,000, and the population of Bahrain is 1 million, uh, close to 1 million 600, um, the, including the citizens and the expatriates, which is the expatriates more than. 600,000. Uh, showing this number, like three medical practitioners, psychiatrists per 100,000, tells us two things, which is uh, first, the society which really suffers from huge stigma and the taboos issue regarding the mental health and, and psychological issues. Yet alone, not to mention when this person has been subjected to torture or some sort of violence. And the other thing that shows us the, these numbers um, is the lack uh, of the state interest and will in providing such mental health. Um, 10 years ago, when I started uh, in Bahrain, these numbers uh, has been increased during the years. Uh, 
um, now uh, the the number of uh, uh, psychiatric clinics and facilities has been mushrooming, especially in the private sector, of about uh, thirty percent. Um, and when um, I speak about the number of people, the number of people opening up, speaking up, exposing, making themselves visible. Um, sharing their trauma of torture or being subjected to violence. That is where the part is. I, I truly believe that the deep scaling happened. Um, uh, we were challenged with the, uh, with the rules and regulations of, especially uh, in my part of the world, nobody talks about the issues of torture um, and the trauma happens due, due to torture. Um, we were not allowed to practice uh, in a normal or a regular way. So that challenge forced us uh, to take a different dimension. We used different platforms to reach out to people. Uh, in the beginning, in the first year, 10 years ago, when we were able, with the limited number of the practitioners and uh, psychiatrists and social workers, um, we were able to reach maximum 400 people per year. But when we used the social media platforms, when we started to post uh, these short videos where we tackle these issues, um, we were able to go for 20,000 people. In 10 years now, whenever I post a video talking about these issues, now we're reaching out to 80,000 people. Wow. Uh, the shift in perception, people are now, um, the, 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 of course, due to the mushrooming number of the medical uh, facilities, psychiatrist uh, facilities where people are attending, it shows us that the mindset of the people here in Bahrain has also changed. The approach has changed and um, they're willing to expose and share uh, their issues and, and problems. Uh, so that when it comes to the um, my experience with uh, with victims, um, when it comes to the, the the system changing, one of the things that I would love to mention, um, ten years ago during the Arab Spring, um, we've noticed lots of uh, medical issues uh, uh, happening due to the use of tear gas, and. The, as doctors, we thought it's not okay to use tear gas um, and, and just raid all the villages here in Bahrain. Um, but the issue is that within the United Nations Convention, it is okay, it is allowed, it's acceptable. But on the ground, we've been seeing cases, we've been see, uh, seeing uh, up to the extent of lethal really deadly effects of the use of tear gas. And we've taken it step by step. First, we started to gather information. We started to make statistics, the, document the results that's happening on, on the victims that these tear gas has been used against them. The next step, we took it forward and we took um, some of these canisters, the tear gas canisters, and we've been examining, examining the contents, the chemical contents of these um, materials that's been used against people. And we've examined it in laboratories and labs in Europe. And we found out that there are some uh, lethal contents and such. Where the third step, we took it all the way to the United Nations and the High Commissioner's Office and trying to change the law and the classification of the use of these materials from non-lethal uh, to lethal. So that was uh, the part where um, scaling out and, and trying to change the system. Uh Thank you, Nada. And uh, another very challenging um, and difficult subject that you've taken on with such um, uh, clear strategy and sensitivity. Uh, that's great. Um, so let's bring in our final speaker and storyteller, um, extraordinaire from Guatemala, working in Latin America. Cara Andrade is the co founder of Habla Centro Informatics. Um, Cara, tell us um, the, the strategies you've been using to achieve scale. 
Great. <clears throat> Welcome. Great. Thank you, Susan. Can you hear me? I was having a little bit of technical problems earlier. Yeah. Great. Perfect. Um, so I want to start out just by thanking you, Susan. Sounds good. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to start out by thanking you, Susan, and the other Ashoka stars on this call um, and all the participants out there for joining this conversation. It's a very important one. Uh, also, big shout out to the Ashoka Arab World uh, organizing team. I'd have done an incredible job organizing this Get Wiser Summit. Um, I was there last year and it's good in person, but it, it's really good to see it continuing in this adapted form during our unforgettable COVID year. Um, and since this is our storytelling moment, I do want to tell you a story and what's a story without visuals. So here we go. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and hopefully it won't um, give us. Uh, any hiccups. <laughs> so here we go. All right. Okay. Can you see it? Yes. You get kudos for being brave. Yes. Yay. Well done. <laughs> yes. Let's hope it goes to the next slide. Um, so I, I'm, I'm first going to start out by sharing a little bit of a map because sometimes people don't know where Central America is and that's okay. Um, but I'm going to tell you a story from Honduras, right? This is the Central American region of Latin America. Um, and the reason I'm telling you a story about Honduras is because on June 28th, 2009, uh, Honduras went through a coup. It's something that a lot of countries have been experiencing um, in one way or another, right? A lot of political unrest. And the, this political unrest and a lot of these uh, crisis moments for us have, have become opportunities for us to work with the community. Um, this one in particular was very important because it helped us launch one of the most important uh, communities and websites for our network, which is Abba Central. Uh, during this time, uh, on this specific date, uh, President Manuel Zelaya was ousted and uh, it did create a lot of unrest and unhappiness uh, with many Hondurans who supported him uh, because it was uh, an ousting by the army and the military. Um, people felt that it was undermining a lot of the democratic principles that Honduras um, was operating under. And, and so there was a lot of uh, protests and, and, and marches and then a lot of heavy handed response from the army uh, was then targeted at people who were protesting. The problem is that this was all happening and like nobody knew what was happening because uh, a lot of the media, like many countries, is private. Right, it's privatized and it has corporate interests and it does tend to be owned by a certain sector of society. Uh, in Honduras, it's not that different. It's usually owned by people like, like the 1%, the people who have a lot of money, a lot of uh, financial interest in keeping the country under a certain political agenda. And so uh, a lot of the news wasn't covering what was happening on the ground. And so uh, in the rest of the world, uh oh, there we go. This is perfect for critical moments. Um, so in in a lot of the not just Central America, but, you know, even beyond in the US, particularly like people didn't know that this was even happening. Right. Um, and so I was contacted um, because at the time I was a freelance reporter and I still do a lot of freelance reporting um, by different community groups uh, and they wanted me to come and cover what was happening in Honduras. And, and the time I was covering what was happening in Guatemala, which is also going through political problems. And, and I said, you know, I really can't, I'm just, there's just one of me, right? And a lot of the bureaus and news organizations have, have been really consolidating and closing because of lack of funding, right? The business model's changing. Um, and so I said, I, I can't come there, but I can teach you what I know, right? Um, and they're like, yeah, that's great, but like, we don't have anywhere to publish. Right. Um, and this is in 2009. And so, you know, a lot of folks still were just using Facebook and things. And so I said, you know what, we can just throw up a really quick WordPress instance. And, and so I said, what do you want to call it? And, and they were just like, let's call it Abu Honduras. Right. And so um, I worked with the different community groups to launch this. This is the first instance of Abu Honduras. And it had uh, a, a really interesting feature at the time because Twitter wasn't providing short code access um, from, yeah, so sorry. Um, so to, for people to be able to text message um, without having a data plan. And so we did something really Im important on the ground, which was we made it possible. We created something, a whole framework 
for them to be able to, to be able to post directly as a text message. So like one person could have an Android phone uh, with an application and everybody could text that phone. Um, and then you basically create a distributed system that goes into um, you know, the ABLA Honduras website. Later on, we were able to expand it to include posting to the different websites. And so that really democratized uh, technically how you could share news from on the ground. And, and so that's how Alba Central was born. Um, and then our communities grew. Uh, all of them grew in different um, critical periods. Um, hopefully, let me see if it comes out here. So there's Alba Honduras, Alba Costa Rica, Alba uh, Guatemala, Alba Guate, and then just all these different communities requested it. Um, and I think a lot of it was in response to like, well, you know, what is the foundation of this free and democratic society that we live in? And so a lot of people on the ground were saying, well, a lot of it is if we're gonna be active informed citizens, we need to have information, access to information. We need to have these tools, right? Be accessible to us with whatever we have available to us to be able to use to access this information. And we really just wanna live a peaceful life, right? And so these are the three principles that we came up with together um, we worked a lot with young people, right, and teaching uh, groups of people, like anybody that wanted to, to be part of these websites and these communities to, to be able to, to just have access to telling their story. And, and so when I was asked to be part of this panel, um, I was brainstorming on the scale up, scale out, scale deep. And I found a really interesting report um, by the J.W. McConnell Family Foundation. Um, it was a report uh, that was done by the Tamarack Institute. And I found this super helpful um, as a visual. And, and it, it actually helped me understand, too, the areas that we needed to work on a little bit more. And so the scale up was like, you know, where you're looking at impacting laws and policies, the scale out where you're impacting the greater numbers, right, and the scale deep where you're uh, impacting cultural roots, right. And in any given point, um, when you're working on um, a project, right, where you're looking at systems change, I think you kind of tend to kind of do a little bit of all three, but, but then you start to see like where your focus is. Um, one thing that I found super helpful in this report is this taxonomy, right, where it's describing the different strategies that usually go with, uh, they're identified with different types of scaling. Um, and so what I wanted to go through today with my uh, particular endeavor is, you know, we, we did a lot with scaling out, right? And with scaling out for us, we, we were very part of our, our business model, as it were, just like our model for, for change was having this very deliberate replication by providing local ownership of each website and the community forming itself um, locally, right? Just very self-organized. The, co the core principles were really the fundamentals of journalism, community organizing, and inclusion. Um, we made sure with all the websites that, that the technical always was there for a reason. It wasn't like we're just going to create something technical because it's fun or because we decided from our end that it, it made sense. It had to be a feature that was requested by the community. Um, and so a lot of, I don't know if somebody could mute, I'm not sure if it's one of us. Um, so we we did actually make it possible to localize the native languages. So like in Guatemala, for example, um, the website could be in any of the 25 different indigenous languages. Um, people could adapt content and editorial practices as it made sense in their context. Um, for the you know types of scaling on the scaling deep, um, the other thing we really focused a lot on was the cultural roots, right? Cultural ideas, really by doing what we were doing, just changing the whole notion of like, who can produce content, right? Who who uh, is entitled to certain information, right? And so really, we just did it. And, and so the sites gained a lot of traction um, and a lot of just local support and trust. Uh, the Scaling D for us, uh, we were teaching a lot of storytelling principles that you get from journalists, um, but I think it's, there's also, uh, you know, age old storytelling practices, right? Um, we did focus a lot on making visible the things that were invisible that people just hadn't heard of um, that were happening, even within the country, like some people would know what was happening in certain parts of, of say, Honduras, um, because they just weren't connected to each other. And so the tools made it possible and the community driven approach also was incredibly important. Uh, the humanizing of problems, right? A lot of times there was a big urban rural divide. And so we made sure to kind of try to bridge those divides as much as we could. 
uh, cross-cutting strategies for us is we were very, um, very, very intentional in focusing on building public and private networks and partnerships, whether it was content, um, training, distribution, anything we could um, to create those kind of um, very diverse networks. Um, we made tools and trainings uh, open source uh, and available to people so they could also use them and adapt them as they needed. And we made sure to really modularize tools, right? Like just make them kind of like micro tools, like whether it was like mini applications that were very lightweight, like super lightweight, like CMSs. And so that's um, that's ma mainly the areas we worked in. Um, we didn't do too much on the policy. And so I think in, in future iterations of the project, I think it would be very, uh, I think it would be a very good way to kind of uh, scale up for us, right? And so thank you. Um, I, here's my watchdog who often accompany me to a lot of trainings and reporting. So <laughs> he thanks you and I thank you. Thank you so much, Kara. And that was a comprehensive uh, presentation on the strategies and insights that you've gleaned from this work. It's great. Can I, uh, in our remaining time, can I come back to Angelou and ask um, <laughs> about the insights that you've gleaned from doing this work? Sure. And I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, I think what, what I've seen over these years of doing this work is that, um, and particularly over the past year or so, is that time, like there's so many changes that are happening, you know, like rapid changes. And um, that, so, so we're experiencing racial crises, environmental, health, economic, you know, it just goes on and on, and all of these systems are broken. I, I, I often think of this year in particular with COVID, it's really shined a light on all the disparities, all the marginalized communities, as Kara said, you know, the need to make the invisible visible, you know, to really give voice to the marginalized. And I, I see, my insight is that like the Wizard of Oz, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it, and it's like this this belief that this one person is just going to solve everything. And then, you know, you get to the, the curtain and you pull it back and it's just this one little guy, you know. So I, I, I kind of feel now, I, I often think of this for some reason, but we can't do it just with one person. You know, we really need multiple systems and dynamic solutions and multiple leaders that are really coming up with innovative ideas and have a different way of leading. So we need them to be empathetic and to be uh, about solutions that they're working on. So that, that's what COVID and this whole era has done for me. It's given me a new insight as to how we can work together to, to solve some of these solutions. That's beautiful. Thank you, Angelou. How about you, Amina? What insights have you um, taken from doing this work? Thanks, trying Susan. To achieve scale? I've, I just wanted to say I've really enjoyed hearing all these different stories from around the world and kudos to all of you for all the incredible things you're doing. Um, uh, three main takeaways for me for, for insights is just that one, your reputation is so important. And so you really need to put in the time to build trust and make sure that, um, you know, that, that the key stakeholders, that all the important people for you to be successful understand the work that you're doing and understand, um, you know, how, how you're doing it and what outcomes you have so that they can trust you. Um, and the second is that the, the work that we did scaling deep really allowed us to be able to have a strong foundation to be able to do the scaling out and up. Um, I'm not sure that we could have been doing the scaling out and up if we hadn't first done that deeper work to build those ties and connections to the stakeholders. Um, and finally, just that behavior change and you know, changing attitudes, changing behaviors, this kind of um, work really takes time. And, you know, that, that can be one of the most depressing things sometimes when you've already been working for months or even years and you're seeing such small, tiny little changes. But for so many of these things, it can really take generations. So, um, you know, just to give encouragement to anyone who's facing this, that it does take time, just 
and and celebrate even those smallest uh, even the smallest of milestones um, because it does matter and it does build towards that bigger impact and change that you're working towards. Excellent insights um, and encouraging for those of you uh, listening to this panel, they make it look easy. <laughs> so uh, Miriam, I'd love to turn to you for insights that you've gleaned from the work. Uh, I think we have been, um, like I, I said before, we have been scaling deep quite intuitively and even since the beginning. And actually that has been one of the learnings for us. I used to think of scaling as a quite linear process. So first you start up, then you develop, and then you start to scale. Well, now I don't believe that it, that is how it works anymore. I think you're scaling from the start and you should be thinking about scaling from the very ver first moment when you put something out there in the world. Because the way you think about impacting the world defines how you design and address the product, services, organization, economic model, and so on that you develop. And that does not mean that um, you need to have everything very clear from the beginning or that everything has to be planned in advance, but a, a principle or fundamental vision on scaling is very defining in what you put out there in the world. And in our case, we choose to create impact and scale by addressing very small daily individual choices, mindsets and interactions with activities that have the potential to reach millions of people. So this choice is also reflected in our organization. Um, we are and we want to stay a small organization to keep the innovative and flexible spirit and to put all our own angry energy uh, into the core of our mission instead of managing a big or many organizations. Um, but we are not satisfied with a small reach or impact, and therefore we choose to collaborate with as many aligned or complementary souls from all fields and sectors of society as possible. And this also reflects one of our core values, beliefs or learnings, that our role is to enable others to find their own best suitable solutions. And that demands both um, humbleness or a not knowing curious stance and a strong, supportive, collaborative, equal and reliable presence at the same time. And it's not always easy, but in our sense is the only way to have a meaningful impact. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Nada, can I turn to you? Yes, Susan, I'd like to pick up from uh, where uh, Amina has left, which I, I totally agree with her that the change in, in behavioral, the behavioral change is quite difficult and challenging, but it requires patience. Uh, and this patience, as we are women, we beautify everything. Um, so the patience also in, in this procedure has to be also beautiful and cute. Um, and we'll take it step by step and go with the flow. When I first started uh, my work in Bahrain with all the, uh, the security challenges, with all the political difficulties, with all the threat that I faced myself, I was jailed, I was present subject to torture as well um, among uh, 50 doctors also. But still the process was uh, it was very, um, how do I put it? What's the word for it? It makes you grow. So when you're doing this work for others, you do it from a deep place of believe, you believe in the cause. Second of all, you love what you're doing. When I started it, I thought I was uh, like a raindrop. What change am I gonna make? But th those little raindrops has changed to a river. And that will take me to the second insight of, um, um, of the, uh, my experience in general. Um, it's always good for us to look at every challenge as a door and as an opening to something even better. Um, I'm totally against that we always complain and list difficulties and challenges that we have at our work because um, 
first, I'm really thankful for these challenges. I'm really thankful for these difficulties. Um, because if not for these difficulties, I would not have have moved from attending to hundreds of victims into tens of thousands. So every door that closes in front of us, it will open opportunities, huge doors of opportunities that we, we need to be calm to be able to notice it and to grab it. Mm, that's beautiful. Um, you, you exude the kind of resilience and beauty you talk about. That's great. Thank you, Nada. Um, Yana, can I, I come back to you and your work in Moldova and Romania? What insights can you share with us? Sure. So, um, obviously, following up. Uh, we're not hearing you. Uh, I think you're on mute. Uh, no. Can you hear me now? Uh, can you unmute? I, I oh, was on unmute. Can you hear me? I think Susan might be at your end. Okay. Oh, well, go ahead. Wrap it up. Um, so obviously, it's um, it's hard to follow up because there were so many things that were pointed um, already from you know humility and making sure that you not only hold the expertise but you also hold the respect of those who are supposed to um, work with you and overcoming challenges and all these things so i think one thing that i would want to add just because it is a panel of women and a lot of times um us women uh, tend to downplay some of the things that we do and also um tend to make it uh, look or seem easy on this end is the fact that uh being a reluctant leader does not disqualify you from being a leader um some of the greatest stories of leadership come from uh, people who did not necessarily seek out a position um, of power or a position that's uh, up front and in the public, but quite the opposite. Um, and I think a lot of times just because um, we don't necessarily seek that out, we think that that automatically disqualifies us from the work that we're able to do. Um, so it would be more of a um, I don't know if an unsolicited advice or, um, you know, the, um, the ask of other women who are looking at uh, some of the people on the panel thinking, oh, I could never do that and I don't necessarily have what it takes. Like, don't doubt yourself. I think we've all been in a position where we thought that what we're doing right now uh, was a far-fetched reality and yet uh, here it is. That's beautiful. Yeah. And Kara, why don't you bring us <laughs> home with a couple of insights? Thank you, Ayana. Yeah, I mean, I've been reading, I'm a big fan of Nassim Nicholas Taleb, and uh, I've been reading his book, um, Anti-Fragile. Um, and, you know, like the quote he always had is like, tough times don't last, tough people do, right? And, and I think that's really, for me, um, I'm from this panel, and I think anytime I, I work with other Shoka fellows and, and change makers, is I think it's that aspect, right? Like, that... I also find among my colleagues in journalism, right? It's not just resilience. It's like this, this like we, we're benefiting from disorder. Like, you know, we're getting stronger um, as we encounter these disorders because we're responding to them and we're adapting from them. And I think that's a really fundamental part of the work that we do is also being able to help others develop this, um, this more, uh, I would say, complementary. <laughs> relationship, mutualistic relationship with what is the disorder, which will always be part of existence, right? Is that um, we can't, and one of the things Talib uh, Nassim starts really with his book is he says, well, you know, do we want to be like candles where like the wind will blow them all out? Or do we want to be, you know, like uh, a, a fire that benefits from the wind and just gets bigger as it gets the wind, right? And I think we're less on the candle side and more on like, give us more wind, right? And so uh, I really appreciate being part of, of the strength that is here. Uh, that's beautiful. And these are all really apt metaphors. Uh, I want to celebrate each and every one of you and this beautiful community um, that together we constitute and are part of the larger Ashoka family. Uh, congratulations. Um, to each of you uh, for what you've been able to manifest and bring into the world and to our 
wonderful colleagues uh, from Ashoka's uh, Arab world in being able to organize the Wiser Summit. Um, as you can see, uh, they wanted to take on uh, the, the linear thinking, um, the one way that uh, the, the world was thinking about achieving impacts, um, just simply through the usual business approach of multiplying impact to become the largest in the world. But as Miriam was saying, um, she wants to stay a small organization, but have meaningful impacts. And through changing mindsets and scaling deep or scaling up and changing the laws and policies and regulations, not only have you been able to do that, but you've also been able to achieve greater um, uh, impacts on people. And I think that is uh, the encouraging part of how shift happens. You're making it happen. Uh, we celebrate you uh, and enjoy the rest of the Wiser Summit. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.